Gerald. We did it. We survived 2020. <laughs> Oh, oh. oh, Emily, I need your help. You see, I am part of a virtual theater company. Ugh, like so many of us these days. I know, right? Well, we're just a group of out-of-work puppets looking for a creative outlet. So we founded Rainbow Connection Theatrical. I love that. But, but now we can't decide on a show. Too many puppets with opinions. So many flapping heads. Oh. Oh, I know, I, I relate. Well, Gerald, you can't go wrong with the shows from the golden age of Broadway. Some of the biggest and best musicals in history were written during that era. Plus, I know you do a mean Ethel Merman. You'll be so wow. Exactly. And you know what? This is the perfect time for our next musical theater history lesson. Let's learn all about the golden age of Broadway. Give my regards to Broadway. Remember me to Harold Square. Tell all the gang at 42nd Street that I will soon be there. Whisper of how I'm yearning to mingle with the old time throng. Give my regards to old Broadway. As the United States entered the 1940s, the country was at war and the relevance of Broadway musicals was waning. Once the most popular form of entertainment in the 1920s, Broadway musicals would take a back seat to talking pictures by the end of the decade. The greatest stars and songwriters of the New York stage would move west in the hopes of finding success on film. While the American musical would still churn out hits by the likes of Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, and the Gershwins, Broadway would forever play second fiddle to the motion picture industry. But Broadway musicals were still quite a draw, and since we're talking about the 1930s here, we're still in the pre-rock and roll era, so the songwriters of Tin Pan Alley were churning out the biggest and most popular hits. Cole Porter wrote the quintessential 1930s musical Any goes. Irving Berlin crafted multiple musical reviews, many of them geared towards veterans and servicemen, especially at the outset of World War II. And George Gershwin, along with his brother Ira, wrote the first Pulitzer Prize winning musical of The I Sing, followed by the operatic masterpiece Porgy and Bess, before he tragically died of cancer at age 38. Broadway in the 1930s is very different from the Broadway of today. Do you know why? Oh. I remember this from our Origins of Broadway video. Because musicals were a vehicle for hits, they would be viewed by modern audiences as little more than musical reviews or expanded vaudeville acts. That's right, Gerald. Good job. Most musicals relied on a flimsy plot in order to showcase the hit songs or the star headliner or both. So in other words, the songs could be easily lifted from the plot and the story would remain intact. 1927's Showboat pushed the boundaries of musical theater by adopting serious themes and subject matter, as well as a racially integrated cast. 1931's Of Thee I Sing proved that political satire could work in a Broadway musical. And by 1940, we got one of Broadway's first anti-heroes with Pal Joey. These baby steps would lead to a new era of musical theater. And by 1943, Broadway would enter the golden age. The golden age of Broadway can be defined in three little words. Rogers and Hammerstein. Yeah, that's right. We discussed Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II at length, so if you're interested in a more detailed lesson, please check out our Give My Regards To episode on them. However, we're gonna have to talk about them again because the golden age of Broadway begins and ends with R and H. Their first musical collaboration in 1943 kicks off the golden age of Broadway as they developed an entirely new style of crafting a musical book. Oklahoma was the first musical to fully incorporate book, music, and choreography into the story. And this risk paid off, as it was a huge hit running for over 2,000 performances. The show was so successful that in 1944, they produced a cast album. Indeed, the original Broadway cast recording of Oklahoma was the very first OBC, don't call it a soundtrack. Any original musical 
musical you see on Broadway nowadays has a little piece of Oklahoma in its DNA. Rodgers and Hammerstein would create a plethora of new musicals throughout the 1940s and 50s. Some flops, but most of them hits that we still perform today. Musicals like Carousel would introduce the idea of a musical soliloquy. South Pacific earned the Pulitzer Prize for tackling topics like race during World War II. And The King and I would turn a young Yul Brynner into a star. The same year Oklahoma premiered was also the year Oscar Hammerstein fulfilled his dream of adapting Bizet's Carmen into a new musical theater piece featuring his original lyrics. The result? was Carmen Jones, which updated the opera's setting to the post-World War II era and featured an all-black cast. There was a boom of black musicals in the 1940s, bringing an entire new generation of black actors to the stage. Like all Broadway musicals, some of these shows were hits and some not so much. For example, the musical St. Louis Woman opened in 1946, and while it wasn't really a hit, it gave the iconic Pearl Bailey her first Broadway role and introduced a number of standards by composer Harold Arlen and lyricist Johnny Mercer, like uh, any place I hang my hat is home, I had myself a true love, and come rain or come shine. 1947's Finian's Rainbow tackled race by having a racist white character turned into a black man by a leprechaun. It's an odd show. And of course, in the 40s, this was accomplished by using that time-honored Broadway staple, blackface. Ugh. Don't worry, nowadays when anyone does Finian's Rainbow, they simply double cast the role. Ugh. Okay, anyway, it was Rodgers and Hammerstein who got the ball rolling for a new generation of musical theater creators in the 1940s. In 1944, just one year after Oklahoma, the book musical would take another leap forward when On the Town hit Broadway. Inspired by the risks taken by Rodgers, and Hammerstein, the team of Betty Comden, Adolph Green, Leonard Bernstein, and Jerome Robbins sought to integrate dance and music even further into the plot of their New York City Valentine. For more on the history of On the Town, make sure you watch our lesson on NYC musicals, by the way. Other future legends of Broadway began to pop up, too. Songwriters Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe combined their powers for the first time in 1947 with their musical Brigadoon. And in 1949, a doe-eyed gamine with a gravelly voice named Carol Channing hit the stage in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and became an instant legend. Hey Gerald, have you ever heard my Carol Channing impression? So, so many times. You haven't? Oh, well then. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. Very different from Marilyn Monroe. And hey, the old guard wasn't down for the count quite yet. Cole Porter and Irving Berlin, the star songwriters of the previous decade, had to learn to adapt to this new style of situation show, as Berlin called them. These guys were used to writing hits, not composing musically integrated scores. They learned, though, and in 1946, we'd get Berlin's Annie Get Your Gun, starring one of Berlin's favorite muses, Ethel Merman, and produced by Rodgers and Hammerstein, followed by Porter's Kiss Me Kate in 1946. In my opinion, both Annie Get Your Gun and Kiss Me Kate are coming to the end of their social relevance, but since those guys were so darn good at writing hits, I do believe we should maintain many of those shows' wonderful songs for reviews and cabarets. I mean, come on, we can't lose backstage anthems like Another Open in Another Show and There's No Business Like Show Business. And yes, I may have performed songs from both of these shows at LA Cabarets. Can I see? Sure you can. <laughs> Take it away. Yay! Brush up your Shakespeare. Start quoting him now. Brush up your Shakespeare and the women you will wow. But I lose all my luster when with a Bronco Buster, oh, you can't get a man. Both Annie Get Your Gun and Kiss Me Kate were smashing successes from the guaranteed hit makers of Broadway. The Golden Age would bring about another Broadway institution we still hold dear today. 
On April 6, 1947, a night most performers had off due to it being a Sunday, the American Theatre Wing threw a semi-casual party giving out awards celebrating the Broadway shows of the current season. Named after the Theatre Wing's late chairman, Antoinette Perry, this ceremony would become an annual tradition and evolve into what we know as the Tony Awards. Things were going well for Broadway. Again, not as good as they were a few decades earlier, but still fairly good. It wasn't until the 1950s when a new invention would allow Broadway musicals to reach a wider audience than they ever had before. Oh, sliced bread? Super glue? Oh, penicillin. Penicillin, that's from a few, no! I'm obviously talking about the television. Oh, I thought I had it with penicillin. Darn. Popular variety programs like The Ed Sullivan Show would book talent from Broadway in order to promote the latest and greatest musicals. Everyone in the country could go out and buy an original cast recording, then get a sneak peek of that very musical on their TVs at home. It was a total game changer. And when you talk about game changers in the golden age, you always come back to Rodgers and Hammerstein. On March 31st, 1957, they took full advantage of the medium of television and created the first live TV musical event, Cinderella. Over 100 million viewers were able to see a full, brand new Broadway style musical broadcast directly into their living rooms for the first time in history. The 1950s was so chock full of iconic musicals and legendary performers, it's hard to take it all in sometimes. 19-year-old uh, Julie Andrews made her Broadway premiere in The Boyfriend in 1953. Gwen Verdon made her premiere in Can Can the same year, and her featured performance went down in history for literally stopping the show. Like seriously, they had to bring her back on stage in her bathrobe to do a bow because the thunderous applause simply would not end. They recreate this moment in Fosse Verdon, by the way, so check that out. It is just mwah. Oh, speaking of Bob Fosse, in 1954, he choreographed his first musical, The Pajama Game, after he realized he wasn't quite cut out to be a performer. And then, in 1955, Fosse was tapped to choreograph Damn Yankees, which introduced him to the show's rising star, Gwen Verdon. <laughs> and the rest is Broadway history. Going back to the pajama game though, it's also famous for being the first musical produced by the Prince of Broadway himself, Hal Prince. Hal, it's about cats. Not long after, Prince would befriend one Stephen Sondheim, setting the stage for a collaboration that would dominate the 1970s. Sondheim, who was all of 25 years old and had been mentored by Oscar Hammerstein himself, would join the creative team of his first Broadway musical, West Side Story, in 1957. Believe it or not, West Side Story, one of the most beloved musicals in history, was overshadowed by the big feel-good musical of the season, The Music Man. West Side Story's themes were a tad too dark and the sophistication of Sondheim and composer Leonard Bernstein would be rather unappreciated until the 1961 film version. And no, we do not accept Music Man slander in this house. We love Meredith Wilson and Harold Hill is a dream role of mine. Don't at me. You can at me. Come at me. Catch me outside. How about that? Oh, Gerald. Yeah, that's right. That's topical. <laughs> I could truly just rattle off the hit musicals from this era and you would know at least a song or two from most of them. Ethel Merman and Irving Berlin would team up again in 1950 for the musical Call Me Madam, featuring one of the best partner songs in Broadway history, You're Just In Love. I you hear singing and there's no one there. It is not so surprising I that you smell feel very strange and the trees are bare. Damon Runyon's lovable gangsters would sing and dance in Guys and Dolls. Rosalind Russell tackled her very first musical with Wonderful Town. Beloved Broadway star Mary Martin would fly as Peter Pan, and a popular comic strip would come to life in Lil Abner. 1956 was a particularly notable year, not only because Judy Holliday cemented her place in Broadway history when she starred in Bells Are Ringing, but the year is probably most remembered for one of Broadway's biggest hit musicals, My Fair Lady. Lerner and Lowe, who teamed up with the musical Brigadoon a decade before, remember that? They decided to adapt George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, and the result was a musical that won multiple Tony Awards, elevated its star Julie Andrews into Broadway's upper echelon, had an original cast recording that was the 
best-selling album of the year and became the longest-running Broadway musical to date at 2,717 performances. At the time, and even nowadays, My Fair Lady is often referred to as the perfect musical. As the 1950s came to a close, Broadway was still very much in the throes of the Golden Age. In 1959, we would see Fiorello win the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, becoming the third musical to do so. Songwriters Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach would find future success in the decade to follow, with musicals like She Loves Me and the generation-defining Fiddler on the Roof. Stephen Sondheim got his second shot at writing musical lyrics when he teamed up with Julie Stein and Arthur Lawrence to create Gypsy, starring Ethel Merman, who, for perhaps the the first time in her decades-long career was finally able to tackle a dramatic role like Mama Rose. We saw things come full circle with the legacy of Rodgers and Hammerstein when Mary Rogers, Richard's daughter, followed in her father's footsteps and composed the music for Once Upon a Mattress, the musical rendition of Hans Christian Andersen's The Princess and the Pea. Mattress is also notable for the show's star Carol Burnett making her Broadway debut. 1959 would also mark the final collaboration between Rodgers and Hammerstein. Their last musical, The Sound of Music, was a marked departure into sentimentality for the duo. Many of the critics scoffed, but the show was a hit with audiences and is, of course, one of the world's most beloved musicals ever. The Tony Awards that year would see the first and only time two shows tied for Best Musical, those shows being Fiorello and The Sound of Music. Just one year later, Oscar Hammerstein II would succumb to stomach cancer, passing away on August 23, 3rd, 1960. Thus, the golden age of Broadway came to a close. The 1960s would be a strange amalgam between the book musical traditions of the 50s and the genre-pushing experimental work of the 70s, but that's another lesson for another time. Nowadays, many of us equate these golden age musicals with a show we did in middle school or high school. And that's for good reason. Foundational musicals from the Golden Age are extremely important when it comes to educational theater. Since the form has constantly been evolving since the early 1900s, there are musicals well suited to different stages of development. The Golden Age musicals are usually fairly tame when it comes to tone and subject matter. It was the 1950s after all. Yet they still managed to tackle challenging themes. See Rodgers and Hammerstein's You've Got to Be Carefully Taught from South Pacific as a prime example. The music of these Golden Age shows also tends to be simpler, so they're better for younger performers than something written in the 70s or 80s. But hey, we keep reviving these shows for a reason, right? And a lot of them are just darn good musicals that you'll see everywhere from high schools to professional companies. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, you got a music man before you can Hamilton. The golden age of Broadway left us with works of art that would shape the musical theater landscape for years to come. So whether it's a Broadway revival, a black box reimagining, or a high school musical, Please don't take for granted the shows from this marvelous era. Broadway wouldn't be what it is today without them. Oh, this is great, Emily. I have so many ideas now to take to the theater company. I'm leaning towards Gypsy myself, mostly because we have a cow puppet in the group who has been dying for the right role. <laughs> she would be sublime, singing Mamo Mamo. Right. Well, if you decide to go with the, uh, you know, one human amongst a cast of puppets trope, I am uh, available to play Princess Winifred in Once Upon a Mattress. <laughs> I've always been shy. <laughs> Still got it. Expand your musical theater knowledge and it'll make you a better musical theater performer, I promise. Until next time, Broadway babies. We'll call you. Ugh. Nailed it. So, you say you have the perfect part for me in the brand new season of the show you're starring in? <coughs> well, who do I get to play? Your dad! <laughs>